Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here for my third, and third installment of a Fireside Chat. Uh, I'm Dr. Tony Sanders, the State Superintendent of Education. Uh, glad to have you joining us here today uh, as we have a great discussion with Sal Khan, the founder and CEO of Khan Academy and author of a new book that we're going to be talking to him about today. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, I wanted to just remind everybody that these Fireside Chats are periodic ways uh, for me to bring to you leaders across the nation in the public education and leadership space. Uh, Sal Khan is uh, kind enough to join us today. I met Sal originally at a Council of Chiefs Tape School Officers Convention uh, about a year and a half ago, right after I took this position. And I got to hear him speak early in the early, uh, it's hard, hard to believe that we're saying the word early related to uh, artificial intelligence, but the early phases of AI in public education uh, and I was blown away by his remarks, and I was so thrilled here a few months later to see that he came out with a new book called Brave New Words uh, that we're going to be talking about today. So, Sal, it's an honor to have you with us here today as we talk to principals, teachers, uh, and legislators, uh, and a whole variety of other people from across the state of Illinois. So, thanks for joining us. No, no, thanks for having me. I, I want to start off with uh, a little bit of background. Again, I mentioned this is the third fireside chat I've done. The first one I did was with Simon Sinek around leadership. The second one was with Goldie Hahn around uh, mindfulness. Uh, but artificial intelligence really seems to be the forefront of everything that educators are talking about in this day and age. Uh, and with your new book coming out, it's it's I'm kind of starstruck because after your book hit, I got to see you on CNN on a Sunday morning. I've seen you doing guest spots everywhere. So it is such an honor. But I don't want to make the assumption that everybody knows who you are or knows about Khan Academy. Uh, and I just think the story behind Khan Academy is so powerful uh, that if you don't mind, could you introduce yourself to uh, to all of my Illinois friends here uh, and, and tell them a little bit about Khan Academy and, and how it is that you you came to this mission in life? Yeah, no, ha happy to. And, uh, you know, I historically when i give talks and stuff i often tell i used to always tell the story it's kind of a quirky story of how i fell into it but i actually think it's actually it's very good for thinking about the ai journey because you don't want to put technology in front of the problems you're trying to solve so you know to answer your question khan academy is a not-for-profit with a mission of providing free world-class education for anyone anywhere which is arguably also the mission statement of the global public education system so we're very aligned on that front uh, but it, it all started, I've always had an interest in education in different forms, uh, but one thing led to another. I found myself working in tech, then went to business school, then found myself as an analyst at a hedge fund. I was in Boston at the time and I had just gotten married and my family was visiting me after the wedding from New Orleans where I was born and raised. And it just came out of conversation that one of my cousins who was 12 at the time, Nadia, was having trouble with math, unit conversion in particular. I offered to tutor her when she went back to New Orleans. She agreed and slowly but surely, I honestly, the first couple of weeks was just deprogramming her lack of confidence, but then she understood unit conversion. She got caught up with her class, a little ahead of her class at that point. I often say I became what I call a tiger cousin and I called up her school. I'm sure a lot of the educators here love those type of phone calls. Um, and I said, you know, I really think Nadia and Iman should be able to retake that placement exam from last year. They said, who are you? I said, I'm her cousin. And they led her surprisingly and the same nadia who was struggling even in a slower math track was then put into an advanced math track so i was hooked it was a way for me to connect with my cousin and it seemed to make a, a real impact and so i started tutoring her younger brothers word spreads in my family that free tutoring is going on and before i know it i'm tutoring 10 15 cousins family friends the whole time i have a day job i'm working as an analyst at a hedge fund um, but I saw a common pattern that, frankly, a lot of educators see is that uh, the reason why students are struggling isn't because they aren't smart. It isn't because they aren't hardworking. It isn't because they don't have access to great teachers. It's oftentimes they have gaps in their learning, um, either things they never learned well in the first place or things that they forgot over the summer or over a break. And that's what was holding my cousins back. A lot of times it, it, it becomes very pronounced in say an algebra class because they're a little bit shaky on their exponents or a little bit shaky on their negative numbers or on dividing decimals. And so what a tutor is able to do is personalize and zero in. But even when I was scaling to 10, 15 cousins, it started to become a lot harder. Uh, and you can only imagine if you're a teacher with 30 students in a classroom. And so that's right. when I said, well, maybe I could write a little bit of software for my cousins to get a little bit of practice um on the the places where they had weak spots so that 
we could do more on on our phone on the phone based tutoring sessions. Um, that was the first Khan Academy. It had nothing to do with videos at the time. Two thousand five, two thousand four, I started tutoring cousins. Two thousand five, I started making software for them, and that's when I got the domain name Khan Academy. Two thousand six, a friend suggested that I make videos to supplement the software I was making. Thought it was a silly idea to upload videos onto YouTube. Thought you know that's for dogs on skateboards, cats playing piano, whatever else. Gave that a shot, and um, you know my cousins famously told me they liked me better on YouTube than in person. And I think what they were saying is that they really appreciated having an on-demand version uh, that they could pause, repeat, watch whenever they want, not feel embarrassed. Mm -hmm. They still appreciated me in their life. In fact, we were able to go deeper on the phone. Uh, and and a lot of other folks who weren't my cousins who were clearly starting to use both the videos and the software. So it was a significant hobby for many years. By 2008, 2009, it had kind of taken over my life. That's when I set it up as a nonprofit. 2009, I quit my day job to work on it full time, see if someone would, philanthropy would show up. Um, it's always hard in the beginning to start stuff, but by 2010, we had gotten our first funding. And if you fast forward from then to you know, now, roughly, um, you know, Khan Academy is now much, much more than me. Uh, we're over 300 employees. We have thousands of people, uh, volunteers globally. It's in 50 plus languages. Uh, we're over 150, 60 million registered users. Um, 50 plus efficacy studies on, you know, students are able to put 30 to 60 minutes a week of personalized practice. And this is before we talk about even artificial intelligence, that it was, it can, it's accelerating them pretty dramatically. I think we're the, the most studied online education platform. Uh, but that's 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 kind of us in a snapshot. That's wonderful. And so, could you speak to? I've heard you speak a couple of times about um, about Bloom's work and the impact of tutoring. And it it really uh, it to me it's very uh, I, I approach this really enthusiastically. We saw during COVID the importance of tutors uh, to try to at least make up some ground for students while they were in remote learning. Um, but could you speak a little bit to that? I, I know that you kind of use that as an example of how students can grow rapidly, um, but I think you'd probably be better to explain it than, than I am. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's interesting. I did not know about Benjamin Bloom. I, I had heard the name when I started tutoring my cousins, but he wasn't, you know, I wasn't deep in, in what he was doing. I didn't have terms in my uh, vocabulary like mastery learning at the time. But what I was intuitively falling on, which I think a lot of educators have throughout history, in fact, arguably for most of human history, the way to educate someone would be with fairly small group apprenticeship tutoring. If the student is struggling with the concept, slow down a little bit, make sure they have a foundation there. If the student mm -hmm. is able to pick up something quickly, move ahead quite quickly. It's actually only in the last two, 300 years. So it still seems like a long time, but we're talking about out of 200 or 300,000 years of human history um, that we said, hey, let's do mass public education, which is a great idea because this, this kind of more personalized education that I've talked about uh, for most of human history didn't happen for most folks, especially an academic version of it. That was a fairly elite thing to get. So it's a very big idea to have mass public education in the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries but we had to make compromises. Hey, the only way we can afford um, to teach everyone is maybe we batch them into groups of 25, 30, 35 students, have some central administered standards, move them all together at a set pace, um, go through those standards, have some assessments that will kind of sift through the students to some degree. Um, and it's not a coincidence because this was at the dawn of the industrial revolution, that, you know, even the things like the bell ringing, that the, these are really borrowed uh, from exactly other ways that we learned to do things at scale uh, at a lower cost. Um, and so if we were talking 20, 30 years ago, yeah, we could talk about personalization and tutoring. And we know that upper middle class affluent families, they use tutoring as a way to ensure that their child does not fall behind. And that's probably one of the, the major factors why income and family education is, is such a strong correlative with, with, with student success. But, you know, Benjamin Bloom, and to answer your question, in the mid 80s, tried to quantify this effect that people have always known intuitively is there. And he made a pretty strong argument. His paper is called the Two Sigma Problem. Two Sigma refers to two standard deviations. Two standard deviations is a huge effect size. In fact, 
if someone has a study with a two standard deviation effect size, most people are skeptical of it. Um, you know, that would take someone in the 50th percentile to the 96th percentile or someone who's well below average to someone well above average. But he made a pretty compelling argument. And, you know, people have debated how strong the effect is and what kind of a learning model are you using. But he said, look, if you were to give someone personalized tutoring in a mastery framework and mastery framework is just a fancy way of saying if a student hasn't learned it well yet give them the opportunity the incentive to learn it well um, essentially what any i think reasonable tutor would try to do with, with, with students um then you could see a two standard deviation improvement and he even argues back in 1984 that Okay, it's, and he called it a two sigma problem because he thought it wasn't realistic to give everyone a personal tutor. It, it is still cost prohibitive, but maybe you could emulate aspects of it using technology. And he makes an argument, and he had a very simple technology-based system uh, where he makes an argument for one standard deviation improvement. Now, he he really helped coin some of these terms. Uh, he's the first major person to try to quantify this effect and um, some of these terms like mastery learning, et cetera. Uh, now, since then, there's been many, many, many studies on mastery learning, personalization. They've all been directionally the same. They've all had an effect. Two standard deviations is on the larger end of it, uh, but they've all had an effect. Now, I will say, with a very small end, this isn't a study, I was seeing that type of thing with my with my cousins. And, you know, for folks who say, well, we've done some large-scale tutoring studies and we didn't get a two standard deviation effect. We saw a 0.6 standard deviation effect, which even that is pretty big, or a 0.5 standard deviation effect. I said, well, you know, it, it's it's not just tutoring. It, it needs to be high quality tutoring. It has to be high quality tutoring that's connected to what they're doing. And tutoring isn't just unblocking the student and it's also about motivating them. And so there's a lot that we could, we could try to unpack around it, but, um, you know, Bloom tried to quantify it. And I think, you know, what he theorized could be done with technology core Khan Academy has already started approaching what he theorized could be possible with technology in, the, in 1984. Um, so it, it gives us a good thing to shoot for. So I have so many uh, questions, all completely unscripted, uh, but just based on between your book and the different videos and things that I've watched uh, of you over the, over the last few years, it, you mentioned uh, some of the effect size and, and it, it's not lost to me that a piece of that is the relationship that exists between the tutor and the student, right? And you talked about it from your family perspective. Um, and one of the things that I, in your book and also that I've heard you speak about is, is the new relationship that students are having with artificial intelligence and the way you're building it in a way that it is, um, will actually help speak the same languages that the student that it's serving. And not, not, just, not, not just English or Spanish, but I mean, the actual verbiage that they would use in their day-to-day -day lives. Can you speak a little bit more about how AI specifically is using these, these large language models are using the student's language uh, that they prefer in building relationships, even though they're artificial relationships? Yeah, and, I, and, and to be clear, I think we're still at the very, very, very early stages of this. But if you were to ask me three years ago, I would have thought yeah, AI is interesting. It might help us make some interesting recommendations for teachers and students. And we had explored some of that in the past. And I, I write about this in the book when OpenAI reached out to us and they reached out to us six months before ChatGPT came into existence. And what they showed us was eventually going to become GPT-4. And those who followed these various GPT iterations know that when even when ChatGPT came out at the end of November, 2022, it wasn't based on GPT-4. It was based on an older model, GPT-3.5. And so when I saw and, and had the privilege of being one of the first people on the planet to see what GPT-4 could do, and it had issues and it still has issues around, you know, with the AI, you can't always be 100% sure that they're not making up the facts. And it's improved a ton over the last two years, but it, it's still an issue. Math, most people think computers are great at math. Well, generative AI is a little bit more like human beings where it can sometimes make up things and be confident about something that's not true. So how do you mitigate that? But what was amazing about what I what we saw two years ago with GPT-4, and it's only gotten better since, is with a little bit of prompting, you really could get it not just to emulate a great tutor, but but really start to take on some of the behaviors that you would expect of a great tutor. Um, and part of that is, to your point, having a language that is approachable, a language that is, um, you know, a lot of people sometimes ask me, why do you think Khan Academy is successful? Or why do you think, or at least the videos have been successful? Or why do you think, you know, I wasn't the first person to make videos on YouTube or, you know, why was I successful with my cousins? And I think, you know, 
not not to be self-aggrandizing, but one of the things is I I've always tried to have a I I, I a tone of of um, common language. You know, if I whether I'm teaching differential equations or or um, Napoleonic Wars or dividing decimals, I kind of use the same language and I try to use fairly plain language, the type of conversational language any of us would have. And I try to speak with respect. You know, if I'm talking to a a, a first grader, I don't talk like this to them because I find that to be very demeaning. I would not have wanted someone to talk like that to me when I was in first grade. Uh, and if you see, if you actually pay attention to first graders, they talk very fast. They're, they're very fast with each other, very high bandwidth. Um, so for me, it was very important that as we started to explore how to deploy an AI that could start to chip away at some of these tutoring behaviors. If you think about everything that Khan Academy has been doing with videos, exercises, we, we don't have any delusions that it says anywhere close to a real tutor, but it starts to approximate aspects of a tutor. Um, and now we thought with generative AI, we could go further. And one thing that was very important, and I'm I'm very sensitive to it. I've been sensitive to it. You know, I'm not the only person who's made content on Khan Academy, but sometimes we bring someone in and they use very stilted language, very professional language, very buzzword heavy. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. And same thing for the AI. And I, actually, I've been surprised how few people have that are, are putting that editorial lens on the AIs that they are releasing. Uh, you know, if you go to Chat GPT and you ask a question, it's it's nice, but it, it tends to be still somewhat stilted and robotic, and it tends to give you these fairly long text blocks, et cetera. But with a little bit of work, you can actually make them quite natural in their style. And we're always pushing it to see, can it, can it, as long as it can explain calculus well, but it can do it in language that a fifth grader would understand, and it can do it with less words. None of us like to read huge blocks of text if we don't have to, um, all the better. And then, uh, you know, we're experimenting even with giving the AI feedback on like, hey, I mean, my, I always give the example of my daughter liking to speak to the AI in um, Gen Z slang. I thought it was her being silly, but she actually kind of engages more with it. So we're experimenting with that. We haven't run any studies to see whether it definitely uh, drives more learning, but anecdotally, it seems like it does. Uh, but anything we can do to drive engagement and more use, I think is, is, going to be, is going to be helpful. A lot of folks, including myself, initially you think tutoring is all about explaining something a little bit better or unblocking students a little bit better understanding their question and that is for sure a part of it but i actually think the biggest battle with education is keeping a student motivated and engaged uh, 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 if a student is sufficiently motivated and engaged you can throw down a textbook from the 1700s and they'll somehow power through it and if they're not engaged or not motivated you could have world-class everything and um they're still not going to uh, you know get get the gains I agree. And I, I think, you know, listening and reading your book and seeing the examples of how you've been able to incorporate um, the voice, for example, of figures from literature or historical figures or the authors of books so that you can engage uh, in an artificial environment, obviously, but to be able to be a student engaged in a conversation with the author of a book uh, about their material and, and being able to ask questions um, I think it's just one more way to, to your point that it, it, even though it's not human, it, it puts a human edge on it and makes it feel more engaging than, it, than what it is when you're on just a traditional chat GPT asking a question. I would agree. Uh, would, if, if you could go back in time when, when you were starting up Khan Academy, knowing that this, this was coming, what might you have done differently as you were going about uh, developing Khan Academy, is, or if anything? I would have put all the money we raised in an NVIDIA stock first and foremost, but um, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> now Khan Academy would have a Harvard-like endowment if that happened. No, um, yeah, true. in all seriousness, um, you know, if in 2010, 2008, 2000, well, you know, or even earlier, you told me that in 2022, this generative AI revolution was going to happen. Um, you know, in the 2010, 2011 timeframe, it's hard to, to do anything dramatically different based on what was going to happen in 2022. Um, you know, to some degree, we would have probably gone down the same the same path. I think even in our pre, pre-AI path, we, uh, any organization started up does a lot of zigs and zags. And if, if, I, if I had the benefit of hindsight or foresight, I would have just gone a little bit more clearly, you know, in the early days of Khan Academy, we've had we had endless debates about 
all right, are we something that's just there to kind of help students? Are we there that teachers can use us informally as a bit of a supplement? Or are we there that, you know, something that we want to be used as a real meaningful part of the school day and standards aligned, et cetera? And the answer has become yes to all of them. <laughs> and and the reason why I've we now justify that is, well, it goes back to, I got started tutoring my cousins and the best tutors, and I said in the story, at some point, her cousin called the school and connected. Um, the best supports and connections in tutoring are ones that are integrated. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, we we learned that you know a lot of that money was spent on on tutoring, yep. and when it was, for the most part, decoupled from what was going on in the classroom, and it was, it it, it wasn't as effective as when it was coupled. And so we've realized that about Khan Academy that like, yes, it's awesome. We've had this free resource that tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people come just for help on this or that. But if we want to real, really move the dial for a lot of students, we have to work in more systemic ways with states, with districts, uh, so that we can think about how they can more formally adopt um, Khan Academy tools. If I knew what was coming about AI, you know, probably in, in um, 20, 20 2021 i probably would have invested a little bit more of of our you know I, and i would say even since the last time we saw each other when we were talking a year and a half ago conmigo was like hey you know we're doing this interesting pilot to see if, if, if this ai thing has legs right. um now i'm like okay this is really defining of who we are as an organization so to answer you know maybe another way to answer your question i probably would have at the time we were chatting pivoted even more of the organization to really lean into this. Yeah, I mean, I regretted leaving that meeting and not immediately uh, jumping on board, to be to be honest, you know, and, and I'm curious to know more about, so with that experience now, you talk, uh, you, you talk a lot about Newark Public Schools as one of the examples of a district that you've worked with. Uh, and I know you've done some studies from there, but how have you worked with that school district to couple it, to tightly couple it to the students' learning experience so that it is in lockstep with what the teacher is teaching? Is that yeah, I, so I is not, that's something that you're working with the district on, right? Yeah, you know, and this is this is fascinating. Um, uh, this was, uh, what was it? I think, 2021, maybe 2022. 2022, uh, Newark wanted to use what's known as our district offering as, you know, our mission is free world-class education for anyone anywhere, but about five or six years ago, we started going to a bunch of school districts and we'd say, hey, there's a ton of your teachers who are already using us. And by the way, have you seen our efficacy studies? Why don't you use us more systemically? And mm -hmm. pretty much every school district leader said some to some version of, oh, we believe your efficacy studies. In fact, my niece slash son slash daughter slash myself in grad school, you know, you got me through <laughs> or something like that. There was always some version. But they said, um, but if you really want, and, and so we would love to use Khan Academy in a more systematic way, but if you really want us to, you have to give us support, you have to give us training, you have to give us integration with our rostering systems. Um, you need to be aligned to um, not, not star standards, but potentially our curricula uh, that, that we're using. And uh, so that's when we created what's known as a Khan Academy district offering. Uh, and you know we charge a nominal amount, about ten dollars per student per year, that supports this marginal cost. And Newark had reached out to us about two two and a half years ago to to do this, and I was pleasantly surprised. And it makes sense in hindsight why it's worked so well. It was actually the North Ward of Newark, so it's about a third of their school district. They had a new uh, set of leaders who were big believers in Khan Academy, and they. This was before artificial intelligence, but it turns out that there was a teacher in one of their schools who used Khan Academy to great effect, and his test scores were just very different than everyone else's. And they put him in charge of the school's math department. Then that school's math scores were way ahead of everyone's. Then they part of, put him in charge of math education for the North Ward. And that's when it came onto my radar that like they wanted to do this district wide. And um, you know, they've done a very good job of making sure that there's I would call it positive accountability. We, and we don't encourage anyone to sit, to force anyone to use anything. That's the best way to have a bad implementation or create a lot of bad blood or create a lot of bad energy. But there can be good carrots. So they've done a good job of 
one, investing in professional development, making sure that teachers and other school leaders have the time to learn how to use the tools. And, and this is before artificial intelligence again and, and implement it. And then, uh, you know, they've asked us for dashboards and reporting so that they can really see where everyone is. And I think they use positive accountability when they see teachers that are really using it to great effect. And they can also see that those students are progressing more Then they celebrate those teachers. And they've gotten to the point that 70% roughly of the students in the North Ward have been getting to a level of usage that's effect that's associated with pretty strong efficacy. And we're getting some early evidence there that it's that it's not just an efficacy study, it's happening um, in, in the district. And they're now going district wide um, uh, using, using these tools. And so when Conmigo, whenever you're trying to introduce a new technology, I've learned that you wanna introduce it with your partners who have been able to implement new things well. <laughs> um, and, and, and so Newark was clearly one of the first places we went to. Closer to your neck of the woods, Hobart, Indiana was another place. Uh, that we uh, we went to, and those were the first two pilot districts of Conmigo. Well, we have 852 school districts in Illinois, and you you might be getting some calls <laughs> as a result of our discussion today. One of the things that um, I mentioned, one of my earlier fireside chats was with Simon Sinek, and you, you know, in his book, he talks uh, about the law of diffusion of innovation, and and I can't help but to think about artificial intelligence and these large large language models as is that next thing? Uh, and I remember when, when as soon as Chat GTP and other other uh, models became available to the public, there was 15% or so of the population that was ready to jump in and have fun and play around and just kind of knew it was an experiment at the time. Uh, and then you had a large group that wanted to just outright ban it because you're cheating, right? It's allowing kids to cheat in school. And we need to put, you know, over overly regulate it, and it's too soon. Um, I'm curious on your perspective now. I mean, it, it it's not been around that long, but where would you put the uh, uh, your product, for example, on the law of diffusion of innovation? What percentage is now starting to really buy in and see that this can make a difference, not only in the classroom to help teacher uh, help students through tutoring, but also help teachers in developing lesson plans and grading assignments and, and actually helping to promote writing back into the classroom again. So curious your perspective on where it fits. Yeah, I think philosophically, this is, I guess, a bigger one than, than just Conmigo. I think people have, you know, the, as you mentioned, in the early days, there was a knee-jerk reaction to ban, et cetera, and look, for good reason, because ChatGPT is, can be used as a cheating tool. Um, it could be also a research tool and other things, but we know a lot of students, it's very tempting uh, to use it that way. And I was actually pretty upset when ChatGPT first got released. I remember reaching out to the OpenAI folks. It was like, you have us under a non-disclosure agreement. We're supposed to release in a few months. And now you've put this tool out. And uh, and they, I mean, just so I talk about it in the book, but they didn't think they were releasing anything. They thought they were just putting a chat interface on an old model, but it, 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 it made everyone perk up in a big way. Uh, but in, in, in hindsight, it was probably a good thing. It allowed people to just process this and people started to think, hey, if only someone were to use the same technology, but put proper guardrails, use it with a pedagogical lens, use it to support teachers and students in a healthy way, that would be pretty cool. And then Conmigo comes out um, and and they say, oh yeah, this, this is kind of what we were talking about, it has the right guardrails, et cetera. And we, we can talk more about that. There's a couple of areas that, I mean, there's a ton of areas that, that I'm pretty excited about. We talked about the tutoring use case, which, has always been one of Khan Academy's true true norths, but uh, you know one of the things that I realized that, and I and Khan Academy have been guilty of it, but I think all of EdTech or any new curricula development, everyone has been guilty of it. Is we innovate, we create something that we think is pretty cool. We run the efficacy studies, and then we go speak at conferences and we show people, look how cool this is. It improves student outcomes. Blah 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 blah, and people get excited about it. But then right. they go back to their offices, they go back to their classrooms, and they have a million different things on their plate, especially teachers. We know teachers are spread very, 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 very thin. And they don't have the time, training, et cetera, support to be able to really do it. What's different about generative AI is that, yes, it is a new thing, and there is something of a learning curve. But um, here, and this is where we've created a bunch of tools, and there's been some exciting announcements since uh, I last presented to you and that, that group, 
is that we realize it's not just about tutoring students. It can do some very powerful things for teachers, help them develop lesson plans, help them create rubrics, help them create um, uh, projects, uh, hooks for students, maybe eventually help them write, you know, well, even today, help them write progress boards, certain parts of IEPs, just a lot of work. Te as you know, teachers spend anywhere between five and 15 hours a week doing this non-student facing activities. And AI is can be good at a lot of those things. Now it's not good out of the box. You know, when we first tried to prompt these things to write a lesson plan, it looked like a lesson plan. But then when we actually paid attention, we got experts in the standards to look at it, we're like, no, it made up that standard, or that's not exactly the right way to do it. So it's a lot of work. And and I'll put a huge warning to anyone, you know, there's a lot of folks who say, oh, AI is gonna make lesson plans, or there's people who are using chat GPT to do it. Be very careful. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Make sure it's coming from a, a credible source that is doing the work of making sure that what's produced is actually of quality. But um, you know, we were we've been doing a, a ton of work there, and because of a huge grant from Microsoft, they gave us thirty million dollars of compute uh, compute cost. Many people know that generative AI is very expensive computationally. We've and we just released it right before the end of summer, so it's really brand new. Um, Khan Academy Teacher Tools are completely free, and these are not you know, things using cheap free models. Uh, these are using state-of-the-art models that would typically cost someone 10 to $20 a month to access, but we're able to give it away for free to teachers uh, because of this grant this grant from Microsoft. Um, and I, so I encourage first and foremost, educators listening and telling all your friends, uh, those tools are there. And I think you'll be pretty pleasantly surprised. Hopefully it's obviously continuing to improve, but it's not just a chat interface. It's it, I'll, I'll pick the lesson plan example. You co-edit it. So you talk about the standards, et cetera. It creates a draft and then you can highlight parts of it. And you say, hey, can you make this a little bit more engaging? Can you shorten it? I only have 45 minutes in this class period, et cetera. And so you're really collaborating on something. But that's an area where we can now with a straight face make a case to teachers that saying, yes, this is something extra to learn. Um, right. But one, the, the activation energy is much lower. You can go in there and probably in about two minutes, construct something that might be useful for the class period that you're about to go into. And if you get used to it, you'll probably save, you know, we have a school district out here in California that is telling us they think it's saving their teachers at least five to 10 hours a week. That's a huge um, time savings for just the teacher <laughs> to be less spread thin or energy that they can just make the, their lessons that much more engaging, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is a real value proposition for the teacher within hours that they can make a return on their investment. I think every teacher is willing to put extra hours to improve outcomes for students. That's why they're in the role, but it's right. hard when you're already spread thin. But if you can say, hey, you do this, you're, you're learning a technology that's going to be very relevant for the rest of our lives, and you're, it's gonna shave off five to 10 hours of your week, and uh, you, you'll, you'll hopefully be able to then extend into use cases that could be good for students. I think uh, that, that's that's pretty exciting. I'll say one other thing, you know, the writing, we just launched, we're gonna launch actually, we have a version of it already, but in, in a couple of weeks, we're launching what's called Writing Coach. And this is a model where a teacher can assign um, a, an essay, give a prompt. The AI does it with the student, not for the student. So it does, you know, let's brainstorm a thesis, let's outline together, gives the student mm -hmm. feedback. And then the AI can report back to the teacher, not just the final output, but the whole process. And that's valuable just from a pedagogical point of view. The student's better supported now, the teacher has more transparent information, but it also undermines cheating because the AI will now tell the teacher, hey, we spent on we spent four hours on this. It's consistent with Tony's other writing. Um, I'm confident it's his work. He had a little bit of trouble with thesis statements. We might wanna work on that, but, but here's his work uh, while if, Tony went to chat GPT or got his sister to write the paper or went on the internet for one of these other cheating services, our AI will say, oh, we don't know where this paper came from and it's not consistent with his other writing. So I, I think it's doing, we now say feeding two birds with one scone, <laughs> which is um, uh, it, 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 it not only can undermine all forms of cheating, but support students and teachers better. And, and you say it in the book and you've said it in other public events, cheating happened before artificial before AI ever came along. We Every teacher knows that, every principal knows that. Um, what I really think, and, and you, you have a chapter in the book on it as well, and you touched on it in this last piece with the writing. I'm so excited to see what that what that's gonna look like. But uh, the other area where I, I really see this saving teachers time and energy and giving them more flexibility in how they approach student learning is in assessment. Um, and you talk a little bit uh, about 
you know, the, we're forced to use more standardized tests, just like the industrial age model. We have to assess a bunch of kids very quickly. And so multiple choice becomes the default method of doing that. But if you really want to get to deeper, richer, authentic learning through writing or through something longer, that there's potential here, right? With with AI for that to happen and save teachers time of having to actually look at every student's paper on, you know, catcher in the rye. Am I am I am I off base? No, no, I hundred percent agree. And yeah, as you mentioned, I I, I touched on that a lot. There's a, there's a ton of different dimensions of assessment here. As you mentioned, you know, just grading a paper is a form of assessment, and it's a very resource intensive. You can I met a teacher the other day. She has five class periods of 30 students, middle school English teacher. You could imagine that's 150 papers on a weekend that she has to grade on, you know, whatever the great Gatsby or Catcher in the Rye or whatever, whatever, whatever they're reading. That is not an easy thing to do uh, just from a stamina point of view, much less from a consistency point of view, et cetera, et cetera. And, and wouldn't it be amazing if that 20 hours, 30 hours that that teacher would have otherwise spent, I don't know how many hours it would take, 10, at least 10, 15 hours doing that was time of, with, with students. The teacher would love it more and the students would love it more. Um, and so, yes, I, I think having this, the, the, the AIs help give at least preliminary assessments. Um, mm -hmm. There will always be a little bit of a, fair, a fear and reticence around bias and just giving it, I think we need humans in the loop, but that will be, it'll be akin to a, a, a professor um, has support from TAs uh, when they're teaching a course. And now that will happen hopefully uh, with teachers and um, and that's one of the main barriers from keeping more and more rich assessment uh, because it's very expensive historically to assess rich assessment and then there's also the problem of the consistency uh, you know I know growing up I sometimes got very different feedback on very similar writing <laughs> from you know some some educators liked the you know the the flowery uh, more the source laden <laughs> language and some and wanted and wanted you to get the word count while some were like hey the fewer words the better and just communicate as clearly as possible I, I tend to fall in that latter camp but the um uh but this gives you a little bit more consistency and that once again and even this writing coach we aren't just prompting the AI and making it look like it's giving AI feedback we are working with some of the top writing coaches top English teachers in the world to make sure that every time we make an improvement on the model, every time there's a new artificial intelligence model, that it's giving the same feedback that they would and it's giving consistent feedback. But I think that's a huge opportunity. We have a project already working and actually if anyone wants to pilot test some of this, they should reach out uh, to, to our team. Uh, we, are, we have a, a group thinking about the future of assessment itself. Uh, I write in the book, I'm, I'm not against standardized assessment. You know, I always tell people, what are you against standardized or assessment part? It is good to measure things and it's good to do it in a standardized way so you can compare and have consistency. But to your point, historically, this has limited us to fairly narrow forms of measurement um, because it, it's not cost effective or, cons or consistent to do the richer ones. But now AI is going to start opening our aperture a little bit. I don't think multiple choice is going to go away. I don't think, I think you're gonna have a little bit more numeric entry. I think you're gonna have a lot more free response entry. And I think in the next five, you know, we, we are working on a assessment of the future where yeah, maybe you answer some questions in a traditional way, but then you have to explain your reasoning. Maybe you have a little bit of a conversation with the AI. In five or 10 years, you can imagine it being a little bit more simulation driven. Um, and, you know, we just have to make sure that it's able to consistently give similar feedback that's as free as of bias as possible. But once again, you know, right now, uh, some of the richer standardized assessments that are out there we can think of like ib tests or ap exams uh they you know they have they have an army of readers who will look at those essays or those free response questions on those on those ap exams and you know those are not without bias uh as for even fatigue <laughs> uh for, from the humans involved so so yeah i think it's a huge opportunity and if we can have richer assessment and it doesn't have to be text-based it could be video and visual i mean all sorts of things are going to be possible uh, then, then we'll have. A, then I think the aperture of the whole system will open. I, I agree. I, I think you you uh, you speak a lot also about, and I, I don't want to get into a long uh, piece because I don't want to take us too far off of uh, of this discussion. But you talk a lot about competency based education rather than the current model that we that we subscribe to, and that type of assessment would be would be a vast improvement 
towards a competency-based system where you, students could move along a progression and be judged based on their, not just what they learn in their school during the seat time that we have them, but what are they learning through their tutor? What are they learning through work experience? What are they learning through any any number of things? And I, I so I see great promise to that end. I think we're both very much optimistic about the future of public education using artificial intelligence as a tool. Um, as we think about AI as a tool, and I talked a little bit about it before, there are still people that want to just ban it and say, you know, it's don't let it in, don't let our computers even access Chad GTP or Conmigo. Um, to those that are ready to put in place the guardrails, to those that are fully embracing. Um, since we have legislators, superintendents, principals, and teachers, I'd like to hear from your your perspective on on that guardrail conversation about um, you know what what for state policymakers, for example, what are some of the policies they should be thinking about that don't won't stifle but also will encourage districts to start using products like Conmigo um, to to help their students. And, and then yeah. similarly for all the other groups too. I mean, it may be the same for all groups, but specifically legislators, superintendents, like what are the conditions they should be setting for that? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, students and teachers, and I'd say it's, you know, it's in many cases easier to start with teachers. You have to worry less about things like safety, et cetera. But um, I'll, I'll start actually with the adults and then we'll move into the students. I would say if you're thinking about tools for teachers, um, and as I mentioned, you know, we're, what we're, we're, we've been able to, you know, because of that Microsoft grant giveaway for free is really, I believe, by far the best teacher tools available. So if anyone's looking to charge you for teacher tools, um, be very suspicious of that. Um, but the, um, but even then, even free teacher tools, uh, make sure that you have good confidence in the quality of it, that it doesn't just look like lesson plans and rubrics, that it, that the, 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 whoever you're working with has evidence that they're actually working with educators and validating the quality of what you're doing, or you should validate the quality yourself. Um, I think as you start to extend to both teachers and students, uh, there's some wonky stuff that's important. You, you know, data privacy, as you can imagine, and security is even more sensitive in an AI world. No one wants AIs to misuse data, and some of that might even happen inadvertently. So any data should not be used to train the broader models. Um, I think with any ed tech tool, you know, we're, we're nonprofit and our bottom line is honestly the same bottom line as the education system. There's a lot of startups, well, all, all for-profit companies will often have something in their turn, not, not, and I don't wanna you know, throw shade on them, but, but we'll have something in the terms of service of like, oh, we, we'll, we'll protect your data in this way, this way, unless we get acquired or go bankrupt, <laughs> in which case that data is for sale to the highest bidder, you know, who knows who, who that is. So be careful about things like that. Make sure that, you know, all the things that you've always worried about, things like SOC 2 compliance, which is, you know, hey, that vendor's been audited to make sure that they're doing all of the data security privacy things that they should be doing that really minimizes the chance that there's a break in of their data or a leak or things like that. In terms of the user um, features, I think especially if you're dealing with for sure under 13 and probably under 18 students, you should have reasonably good oversight of what they're doing. I'm obviously a fan of generative AI, but we see it already. There are students who will push the envelope and try to do inappropriate things. And so for Conmigo, for example, teachers, if parents accounts are linked parents to, and then administrators, not only can have access to what the students are doing and get summaries of what the students are doing, but it, they'll actively get notified if the student is looking to do a particularly shady something. You know, if a student says, I want to learn how to build a bomb, or I hate these people, or, you know, like. I think you even had a story, didn't you have one uh, where one of your relatives put something in the chat? Was it your daughter or said, put something in there and they, they'd alerted because they wanted yeah, to. Yeah, the other, yeah, it was more of a false positive, but it, it um, yeah, this was, I mean, as you can, her school is using this as uh, a school I helped start. And uh, yeah, my, my daughter went to Conmigo and said, hey, I, I want some ideas for our project. Um, I really want to beat the other team. Uh, it was a group project. And, you know, I guess Conmigo took the beat part literally and, uh, uh, to, you know, and, 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 and told the teacher, but that's fine. The teacher looked at better it, had to give a giggle. Better safe than sorry. So I, better sorry. Safe. I didn't, I didn't yeah, we, we see. 
unfortunately, we do see um, some stuff that's a lot uglier than that, and sure. Sure. and we're able to tell um, the the teachers and ad admins that's happening. And you know, the interesting thing is that ugliness isn't getting created because of the AI. If in in a, in a very strange way, uh, the AI is helping us find it better <laughs> than we had than, than, than we had before. Um, but but yeah, those are the and then also like you know anyone who's claiming to help students tutoring etc. Make sure you know the 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 tutoring the math quality is not perfect. It, it, these large language models can still make mistakes, and I we have done a ton. I mean I think at this point we've invested several millions of dollars just in making sure that we have the most accurate math. And and the math is actually not so hard to get accurate anymore. It's more the math tutoring. Let's say the answer is one third, and a student puts in 0.33. What should the what should the AI say? Um, or you know, you know, like if it's a rounding error or things like that. And so those are edge cases that um, you know once again have a have a um, people should gravitate to quality. I'd also be suspicious of people who are promising too much. I think this recent thing that happened in Los Angeles, uh, where they you know they got some vendor who I think like, promised the, the stars and the moon. Um, for six million dollars, and um, they essentially went out of business with you know, and you know, and, and I think the, the the school district found out from social media or something that that the people they just paid six million dollars to were 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 non-existent. Um, so yeah, be, be be careful. I I would say you know, uh, I definitely kick the tires. I think with any ed tech, be kick the tires. But I think especially something like AI, there's so much power in it, but there's also you know, if there's a couple of bad examples that that start happening, it'll people will start throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and you might not get a second try. That's amazing. Thank you for all of that. I I've got just a couple more questions. Do you, do you have time for just a few more? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so I'm curious in your in your mission of of creating providing for a free world class education for anyone anywhere. Uh, world class, I think. Uh, that definition of what that can look like will change over time. How has how has it changed in your mind now that we've entered this phase? And what does it look like in the next ten years for Khan Academy and Conmigo? What does world class look like in the future for you? Yeah, I, you know, to me, world class. I always give the example of uh, Alexander the Great's tutor was Aristotle. That's world class. <laughs> That's you know, if you if, if if you have, and I would say even some very expensive private schools, they'll have a lower student teacher ratio and you know they have great facilities and everything. And, and they approach world-class more because they might have um, a lower student teacher ratio and, and have a lot of rigor, et cetera, but it's still not quite what Aristotle was able to do with, with young Alexander. And when we talk about it, and, and to be clear, we don't think we're doing this in isolation. That mission statement is something that we are doing, I think for the most part in conjunction with the global public school system. Now there's going to be some, we, we also view ourselves as a bit of a safety net. If you, you know, there's a, a young woman from Afghanistan, Taliban kept her from going to school, Khan Academy was her lifeline. If you're in rural Alaska and there isn't a calculus classroom within an hour drive or boat ride, Khan Academy might be your lifeline there. But in 99% in of circumstances, we see the real use cases happening with, with that teacher that, you know, has 25, 30, 35 students in that classroom. Obviously, we wish we could lower those re the, the, that ratio as much as possible. I would definitely be all for that, but that's out of my pay grade to figure out that. But we want to help that educator, that school district, be able to emulate that level of personalization. Even before AI, uh, let students start to work at their own time and pace a little bit. Teachers can assign through Khan Academy whatever's happening that day and then get a better read on where students are. Um, and maybe the students who are still have gaps get a little bit more support. In the old days, it was through just videos and articles and other things we had and the practice problems. Now the AI um, is part of that, is that part of that solution as well. Uh, but yeah, that, you know, that, that's kind of our, our, our true north. And over the next couple of years, there's still a long way to go. Um, you know, a lot of what we're working on is how do we make the AI even more proactive? How do we make it pull the student, motivate the student. How do we make it really act like a real teaching assistant even more? It's great if it can help do lesson plans and create rubrics, but even advise the teacher on like, hey, may maybe we wanna tweak this lesson a little bit because we're seeing a lot of students struggle with thesis statements or a lot of students struggling with 
factoring quadratics or whatever it might be. Um, and so, so that's my hope to, to make it that much more proactive. That's wonderful. So uh, I have two more questions for you. The first one is really about your book and I'm gonna hold it up. So everybody, that's even behind you, I see. So uh, we gotta make sure we market the book, right? So the book, Brave New Words, How AI Will Revolutionize Education and Why That's a Good Thing. What inspired you to write this book? I mean, I, certainly this is your space, but, uh, but it, I mean, it takes a lot to write a book. So what inspired you to take the time out of your busy schedule to write this? Yeah, it's funny because it's the second book I've written. The first book, One World Schoolhouse, I wrote uh, at the beginning of the Khan Academy journey. This was back in 2011. I remember I gave a, a TED talk and the, the book folks came up to me and said, hey, you should write a book about this. And at the time I was like, why would I write a book? Anything I want to write, anything I want to share, I'm just going to make YouTube videos, give it away for free. That's how I roll. And they said, no, well, you know, books still have a certain weight to them. And I'm like, okay, maybe. And so I did it. And that was the first time I ever wrote a book. Um, and it was a really powerful experience for me. It helped me, uh, you know, One World School House, my previous book, the first third was a little bit of the history of education. Why does the system look the way it does now? Middle third was my journey falling into it. And the last third is what could the education system look like given all that we know and can, you know, that's where the competency base, the personalization, the mastery, more time for creativity, broadening the aperture of assessments, peer to peer. And, 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 and that framework has really benefited me and Khan Academy's ability to communicate what we're trying to do and have a true north. And so when all this AI stuff started happening two years ago, and it still is dizzying, I think for everyone involved, how fast things are, I said, you know what? I want to get my head around this. I want to have a framework for it. And the best way to do that is have a book. And I suspect other people are trying to get their head around this too. So let me write the book. And, you know, my biggest fear in writing a book about something like this is that it's going to go be outdated the second day, the second. Day. So I've tried to write it in a way that I think will hopefully it still be relevant in 10 years and hopefully even in 50 or 100 years. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's really trying to hit all of the questions that people will naturally have and try to give a structured way of, of thinking about them. Well, I do think it does a great job of if for any educator that's fearful of of AI, uh, this your book does an, an exceptional job of really dispelling the myths, um, uplifting what works well, what can work well, but being honest with what the, the, some of the areas, the pitfalls that that could happen. So I think I, I really appreciate your approach in the book, and I, I know it's one that uh, I will continue to recommend to others. I'm going to go completely out the book and ask you one final question, uh, and and. Uh, I ask this of everybody that I have a fireside chat with, so don't think I'm picking on you. And I, I've got to be transparent saying I've watched so many videos of you over the last couple of months preparing for this that I already know how you're probably going to answer it. Uh, but I want to know about your favorite teacher. We're, you know, we've got a bunch of teachers and superintendents and principals here, and I think it's always powerful to uplift those that, that came before us. And uh, so if you could share your favorite teacher or teachers and and why they were your favorite teacher well i'm glad you said teachers i think it would be hard to pick one um I'll, I'll i'll try to do it quickly because i can you know every year or two in my experience there were uh, definitely teachers that stand out to me today um you know i i remember miss well miss miss kraus and miss roussel in second grade they used to run kind of this gifted enrichment program type thing and they were the first teachers that like I felt knew me as an individual and would talk to me almost like a colleague. And it really boosted my confidence. And a lot of what I write about now about what education could be or should be was, I, I really am imagining Miss Krause's and Miss Roussel's classrooms uh, back in second grade. And I had them for several years in a row. Um, so that's part of why I was able to form a really deep bond. Miss Ellis in fifth grade, she ran her fifth grade social studies like a graduate level seminar members to just peel an orange and just keep asking questions keep asking questions not not lecturing um at us the uh you know miss north i remember that was in actually her english class in seventh grade you know it was, it was always these philosophical discussions that i still think about um as an adult uh, as you get into high school uh, mr hernandez was my math teacher miss kennedy was our journalism and english teacher uh, they were the two that wrote my two of my college recommendations. I'm still in touch with them. Um, and but then once again, they really, really knew me. I knew them, and I felt like a colleague in some weird way. 
Um, and then when I was in high school, I also did dual enrollment at, at the University of New Orleans, the local university back then. And I give a lot of credit. There was a math professor there, Dr. Santania. And you know, I was taking his class. I was, I think, 15 or 16 years old. And he saw that I was interested in compute, computers, but my family, we couldn't afford a computer. Um, and so he hired me as a research intern when I was 15 or 16. And that's how I got my first access to a computer. And he was one of my recommenders for college too. And then I could I could keep going on in, in college and in business school, but those are the ones that really hit me from K-12. So in, in K-12, I, I have my own as well, but I also will never forget um, some of the early mentors I had in the, in my work environment. Um, I'm sure you've had those as well that uh, that have stood. Anybody stood out in the work environment as as a mentor that? Oh yeah, and I'm very lucky here too. You know, my first boss is a gentleman by the name of Thomas Curian, who's now done very well for himself. He runs Google Cloud. But um, I remember, you know, I was working at Oracle. I mean, there's a, you know, I remember him. Sometimes we work at a big company. You can get a little cynical, like, hey, this feels a little bureaucratic sometimes. Or does do I matter? <laughs> And, you know, and he used to really like, hey, look, I just show up every day and I just try to make the organization of the world a little bit better today than it was yesterday. And I think that's a very powerful idea. And then post business school, I worked at this very small hedge fund. I, you know, I got rejected by 30 or 40 folks. <laughs> before. I had no background in the field. But eventually this one guy, Dan Wool, gave me a job and it was really just me and him. And he, he was only seven years older than me. He was in his early 30s when he hired me. And um and he took a flyer on me because he said his style of investing, he didn't want someone who thought like everyone else. He wanted someone who's not from the industry. But I remember when, um, you know, the stereotype in finance and a hedge fund is that you work 80 hours a week. You just work super hard. And I remember that first week or two, he said, Tal, you should go home. And I'm like, okay, I'll work from home, Dan. And, and he said, no, 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 I want you to go do other stuff. And I'm like, Oh, really? And and he said, well, no, look, our job as investors isn't to just work ourselves silly for the sake of it. Our job is to avoid a bunch of bad decisions and make a few good ones. And the best way you're going to make bad decisions is if you overwork, spread yourself too thin and get overconfident in your analysis, in your bad ideas, or, or you aren't willing to pivot them. And he said, and the best way to have creative good ideas is to have other things in your life. Read books, do volunteer work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so one, he's right. I, and he was an excellent investor, far better than I would have ever been. Um, so I think he was right on that front. But that also gave me permission to uh, tutor my cousins when they when they needed help. So I still, even at Khan Academy today, I, I'm not saying this to be a nice guy, although hopefully I am a nice guy. I tell our team, like, yes, when you're here, when you're doing the work, like, right. let's do our best. But you need time to have other interests and have uh, hobbies to recharge. And it's also going to make you better at what you do on a day-to-day -day basis at Khan Academy. I take that from Dan. So that closing message it, it resonates. I, it, it should resonate with every legislator, superintendent, principal, and teacher who's listening here today. That uh, what a great message to, as a reminder to each of us that we need to take time for ourselves, for our families. Um, that uh, the job doesn't always love you back, and you got to have other things in your life beyond just the work. So that's a great. Thank you for sharing that personal story. Um, Thank you so much, Sal, for joining us. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll hold the book up. I know it's behind you again. If uh, any superintendents, uh, schools want to reach out, uh, best way to get a hold of you is uh, not to you directly, obviously, but to Khan Academy. Just visit the website. I'm sure there's a contact information. The there. website we also have for anyone who's interested in the districts, all the stuff we talked about. There's districts at ConAcademy.org, and if people do a web search, they could probably also find a lot of the information we talked about. Great. I can't thank you enough for joining me today. And for all of you who are joining us to listen to Sal Khan, the amazing Sal Khan, uh, if you ever see him come to a conference where, where you are, or he's presenting, he's an amazing public uh, speaker and is well worth the time. So um, thank you so much for sharing an hour of your time with us, Sal. It's greatly appreciated. No, honored to be here. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. We'll see you all down the road.